Oh, look who else is in town here tonight. The one and only, Nate Diaz. After the now-famous press conference that Nate Diaz stormed out of, citing under promotion, he continued to dig his heels in and create friction behind the scenes. Nate was sending mixed signals throughout the next couple months, and at almost every point, it was difficult to tell if his fight with Poirier was on or off. Nate said many times that he was ready to fight, but he also seemed to be creating obstacles. I've already been over some of his complaints in a previous video. But one of the issues that became a sticking point was Nate's insistence on launching the 165-pound division. Now, I was starting a new weight class. Because I already heard they wanted to do it anyway. I'm like, let's get it popping. They don't want to do 165. I'm like, what? Because I said it. That's what it is. I see what's happening here. So, uh... Diaz even suggested that if this demand wasn't met, it represented an impasse. UFC told me that Dustin doesn't want to fight at 165. I'll be back next year. But even though Dana had previously sounded open to the division, it's a pretty unrealistic demand to make. In the sense that, if the UFC weren't already committed to the idea, you're unlikely to twist their arm. I mean, it's not just a matter of launching a new division. You're likely also talking about launching 175, dissolving one of the most storied divisions in the UFC's history, and having the entire welterweight roster looking for a new weight class. There's a lot to consider, and it's not something the UFC were ever going to commit to on a whim or as part of the negotiation for one specific fight. Combined with some of his other grievances, the fact that 165 seemed like a hill Nate was prepared to die on, it all suggested to me that Nate didn't really want to fight at the time. Both Poirier and Dana seemed to paint a similar picture of Nate in the lead up to that fight. They wanted to switch it to to five rounds, uh, man, it's just so much stuff, dude. I, I don't even. Nate was being hard to deal with, I believe. Uh, every weight class that they, I mean, they offered it at 55. He wanted 160. I agreed to that, and he kind of negotiated himself out of the main event spot. They offered us the main event. I accepted. Nate over negotiated. We lost the main event. It was just back to back, days after day of him trying to have his way, honestly. The guy signed a deal, uh, tickets went on sale, and you can't just sign a deal and then, you know, do the things that he's doing right now. Eventually, after Poirier was offered a number of potential backup opponents, he grew tired of training in uncertainty and elected to have hip surgery. The fight was canceled once and for all, and hilariously, Nate declared this as a legitimate victory over Dustin. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the whatever happened had nothing to do with him. He mentally fucked himself and, and he uh, pulled out of the fight. He pulled out. So that's a win. That's a win. That's a win for me. I already beat him. But as far as I could tell, Diaz didn't seem to want to fight at the time. Obviously, I don't have an issue with that. I mean, Jesus Christ, we're talking about sanctioned violence here. Joe Rogan has said many times that if you're not 100% dialed in, you probably shouldn't be stepping in there with someone who is. And so Dana White's final comment on this situation was, in my view, pretty fair. And even though it was framed as adversarial between the two parties, it did, in my mind, incorporate Diaz's best interests. I'm not interested in making a Diaz fight until Diaz is just absolutely dying to fight. We'll offer him fights. We always offer him fights. We probably offered this kid 50 fights you know, since since he fought Connor. Um, when he's ready to fight, he'll let us know. I know it's unpopular to side with Dana on anything regarding the Diaz brothers, but I do think that was a line to take on that situation. When he's ready to fight, he let us know. And that's exactly how it played out. Anthony Pettis' spectacular win over Wonderboy seemed to reignite Nate's fire. Like Diaz, he was a former lightweight moving a welterweight. He was himself an OG at a fight game who had put in years. And critically, he was an exciting fighter willing to throw down. He's, been, he's, he's one of the top guys, one of the better guys in the division, and um, most, most, most entertaining fighters in the UFC. Uh, I, li I like that. It's a guy that I, I would actually enjoy watching over the rest of these fighters. Just as Dana predicted, Nate let him know he was ready to fight. His team reached out to the UFC, and in May, the bout was announced. In the lead-up, we got to see some long-form interviews from Nate. One thing I have to mention is that Nate's use of the iPhone 
It's just hilarious. You'd get better camera work from Michael J. Fox on a fucking roller coaster. And it's a repeated feature of his interviews. Dan is my partner, and look what he sent me. Let's see. Look it. He sent me this. How do I turn this camera on? Okay, look, he sent me this. Oh, wow. That is incredible. Yeah, I don't know how to take I don't know how to take that. What is that? <laughs> I don't know how to take that. You know what I'm saying? Look what else he sent me. Oh my god. He's like, Nate, I sent you and I I saw it and I thought about you. Look what else he sent me. Another one? Jeez. Yeah, yeah, two of them. He thought, hey, I, I saw this and I thought about you. I bought it and I sent it over. Tell me when you get it. And I text him, I was like, thanks. But I don't get it. <laughs> He also did one with Brett Okamoto, which is probably the most baked interview I've ever seen. I mean, how much can one man smoke? <laughs> it's just comical. Overall, Nate was clearly in a much better place than he was last year. He still obviously regards himself as the black sheep of the UFC. In fact, one of the reasons he offered for his comeback was that he thought by sitting on the sidelines, he was allowing a promotion to win. The implication being, that the UFC just don't want him. Sitting on the sidelines like that, I, I thought, I was like, well, fuck them. I, I don't need to fight nobody then if, if you guys ain't gonna give me no love. And then I'm like, oh wait, this is exactly what they want me to do. They want me to die somewhere or fall off the bridge. Like. Another thought he had was that the UFC weren't gonna allow him to headline events. This is the, the main event that we're all tuning in for with all due respect to the heavyweights who are great also. But um, they can't be having me headlining no cards. They can't be having me. They can't be having me getting any ideas points. That's what I'm saying. So I got to do it all myself, and this is how we do it. But while he still has many of the same grievances, these have tempered with time. There was never a sense that the fight might fall apart, or that one of these issues might escalate to the point of becoming an impasse, which is progress. I know this never-ending war with the UFC is exactly why a lot of people love Nate. He's a pretty relentless, middle-finger-to-the-man type anti-hero. And I'll be honest, I get a lot of mileage out of Nick when he's going down these types of conspiratorial rabbit holes. But for me, it made much more sense when he was getting 20 and 20 to fight Michael Johnson after nine years with the company. I mean, that's a guy getting absolutely fucked. I've mentioned before that I thought a lot of Nate's grievances since his first McGregor fight have been pretty thin. So it was great to see the guy not letting those things get the better of him here. If you remember immediately after the first McGregor fight, he was laid back, loving life, and just a chilled out funny motherfucker. Beaver walks up right now, you say what to him? Smack. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this was great. And thankfully, we got to see more of that in the build up for this one. He was even able to see the humor in his own attempt to launch the 165-pound division. Uh, how, how close were you, Nate, to getting that 165-pound division started? Fucking, you know, <laughs> I might have put, I might have slowed that down. Right? <laughs> hey, but just when it, hey, when it starts, though, we know who started it. That's right. So it seemed to me the time off was exactly what Nate needed to clear his head. His bout with Pettis was sold as a kind of a, a lukewarm grudge match dating back to when Pettis was champion. Man, honestly, I don't even remember. Um, I, know, I know I was the champ, and uh, you know, I, don't, I don't remember when the actual what event took place, but we just always had this this, 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 this drama. And every time we saw each other, it was just always something, something was going to happen, you know? So uh, it, just, it was just one of those things. I think he might have been jealous I was the champ. He wanted, he wanted a shot at me. But realistically, this fight was much more about the return of Diaz. Could he move the needle? Would ring rust be a factor? Had he evolved? And critically, should he win, what would be next for Nate? All of those questions were answered in August. Luke Thomas did some quality analysis of the lead-up to UFC 242 that seemed to suggest not only was Nate the main attraction, but he was likely one of the top three or four most popular fighters in a fucking sport. So here's a question for you. How popular is Nate Diaz? What if we narrowed it to, let's say, the past 30 days? What about the last month? How are things? And you can see Diaz pretty much higher the whole time, even than Cormier. People who aren't stars don't move metrics in that way. So if you want to remain on the hardline position, say, until we really know, we don't know, okay, fine. Until he is the A-side and headlining, like uh, Brian Campbell and I talked about a morning combat this past week on, on our show, yeah, I think some skepticism is probably still warranted. But 
to me, it's like the debate over whether he's only a star when he's with Conor McGregor. Yo, that shit is over completely. That is so not true anymore. That is so clearly not relevant anymore. That is so that 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 argument has absolutely been defeated. In the fight, ring rust was not a factor. Most predictions involve Nate probably losing the first round and then taking over in typical Diaz fashion. But Nate imposed his will immediately, making an uncharacteristically quick start on his way to a hard-fought decision. I mean, this was a scrap. Pettis had his moments. These guys both got their asses whooped all over the fucking place. But Nate was just better in every round. He mangled Pettis with knees and had some solid submission attempts. It was a spectacular comeback performance that left only one question remaining. What's next for Nate Diaz? Which he promptly answered in the Octagon interview. Jorge Masvidal had a good last fight. Good last fight. All respect to the man, but there ain't no gangsters in this game anymore. There ain't nobody who does it right but me and him. Masvidal. For the crowd in attendance, this was the most gratifying answer Nate could have given. He rolled in in a blaze of smoke, smashed the fuck out of Pettis, and proceeded to call out the most exciting contender in a division. I mean, what a fucking comeback. Calling out uh, Jorge Masvidal. Why, why did you do that? Just because you got to recognize who's the best of the best in this game, and it's not who they're saying it is. It's who I'm saying it is. The call-out and the shocking speed with which the Masvidal fight was put together further reaffirmed the idea that Nate is back and he wants to fucking fight. Masvidal vs. Diaz was announced on September 7th and the baddest motherfucker belt shortly afterwards. Last night, Diaz's guys uh, were going back and forth with us and uh, we ended up getting it done. So Masvidal was pumped for this fight. Diaz is pumped for this fight. I'm excited for it and I'm sure the fans are, are, are very excited to see this. It'll be the main event, five rounds of Diaz versus Masvidal at Madison Square Garden. A dream fight between two of the most gangster ass motherfuckers in the sport. Obviously, they both represent different things. Masvidal's gripe has always been a jaded eye rolling at the direction the sport has gone whereas Nate's beef has primarily been with the UFC. But they've both been swimming against the mainstream current of mixed martial arts. Nate and Jorge both celebrate the most gratifying balls-to-the-wall brawl in his sport has to offer. I can tell he's, his, his way, how he is. He doesn't really have an ego. He's not trying to prove it, and he just wants to fight. Just like me, I just want to fight. I love to fight, you know? And uh, a lot of guys do it for the wrong reasons. I think they do it for that camera right there. They just want to be on TV. Some people actually like to fight. You know what I'm talking about. You like to fight, you know? So. so while there's a lot on the line in terms of pride, there's been a lot of mutual respect and appreciation coming from both guys. You know, Masvidal just did his thing the other day. That was great, you know? It's like stuff like that. <laughs> With all due respect, motivates you to want to fight that person because they've done some great so, shit. Stick that in my bag of great shit, you know, in the fight, fight world. It's like, these guys are the guys kicking them. That's where you start fighting in the fight for in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Fight the best fighters, the mm -hmm. coolest fighters, the, the best. <clears throat> That's the sport I signed up for when I signed up. People have been, I think there's a betting odd taking uh, bets already on whether me and Nate make it to press conferences, whether we'll ever show up to one of them. <laughs> that goes to show we don't do our fucking work in, in, in this media age of talking shit. We're just going to get in there and fucking throw down and find out what's up. The BMF belt has been an interesting feature at this bout. On the surface, it looks like a bit of a gimmick and a lighthearted accommodation of Diaz fight philosophy. But considering one of Diaz's biggest complaints has always been about promotion, it could on some level be an olive branch from Dana. How could you interpret this as anything other than a legitimate attempt to promote Nate? I mean, it's a completely unprecedented move that revolves solely around Diaz. He's also the main event in Madison Square Garden, which I'm sure he appreciates despite the fact that it undermines one of his main grievances. Dana has said it's a one-and-done scenario. If Masvidal wins, I'd expect that to be the case. Jorge seems focused on taking a welterweight belt, and a title shot looks likely for him in the near future. If he beats Nate, I'd expect the BMF belt to be a one-off spectacle. On the other hand, if Nate wins, I don't see it going anywhere. I mean, does anyone think that after the UFC proceed in legitimizing the idea of a BMF belt in a mega spectacle at MSG, 
that Nate will take a step backwards, it's very likely going to be a fixture of future Diaz fights, and the ethos behind the belt will probably be a major criteria in terms of coming up with challengers. And so, this may be a way for Diaz to carve out a lucrative streak of super exciting money fights that doesn't necessarily culminate or even lead towards a title shot. If you look at the upper echelons of welterweight and lightweight, Diaz has his hands full in both divisions, and that has been a major issue. Most of the contenders don't offer Nate the type of risk to reward he feels he deserves. But if he can call the shots with regards to the BMF belt, select opponents on the somewhat ambiguous criteria of their badass nature, which, let's face it, is a matter of Nate's discretion, he may be able to avoid unfavorable matchups, instead headlining cards, taking on bad motherfuckers in whatever division he wants. And so this could finally represent the UFC's best chance at both placating and promoting Nate Diaz, while he maintains a win streak against opponents he wants to fight, and critically, who want to fucking fight. So to me, it looks like Nate Diaz is finally exactly where he wants to be, on top and in control, calling the motherfucking shots.